Section 121 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Boy Who Wanted the Impossible. By Mary Hayes Davis and Chow Lung. Sing Ching, pure gold, was four years old when his parents sent him to a baby school for the first time and told him that the teacher could tell him everything he would like to know. When he saw a queer bird flying around, he asked his teacher, What kind of thing is that in the air? His teacher told him, A bird. And that to be a bird meant to fly around and sing in every place and make music for the people. The boy said, Can I not do it? His teacher said, Yes, you can sing music for the people, but you cannot fly unless you get wings. Sing Ching replied, Yes, I can do that too. Just then the servant girl that his mother had sent came to fetch him home from school. When they reached the park by his home, Sing Ching said, Lao Mei, I want that long ladder and a long stick. The nurse girl did not know what he would do with them, but she finally had to give both to keep him from crying. She was afraid his mother would hear him cry, and that she would come out and scold her for not taking better care of the child. As he took the long ladder, he said, Now I am going to be a bird. His nurse said, You cannot be a bird, Sing Ching. Birds fly. You cannot fly. Why are you trying to climb up the ladder? That is not the way to be a bird. Lao Mei helped him up two or three steps, when his mother called her to come in, and she left him there for a little time. He climbed up, up, nine steps by himself, and fell down. But he was not hurt, nor did he cry. He had no fear. He thought of but one thing. He was going to be a bird. Suddenly his mother came and saw him again trying to climb up the ladder and asked, What are you doing, Sing Ching? He answered, I want to be a bird. Wait, I will try again. I know that birds fly in the air, not on the ground. I cannot fly on earth. If I get up high in the air, then I know I can fly. His mother thought he wanted to climb up and get a bird. She looked all around and said, There is no bird up there now. But, Amma, I want to be a bird. The servant, Lao Mei, came just then and explained to his mother. His mother said he was a foolish boy and gave him food and sent him to school again. In two hours the teacher sent all the boys out to play. They ran to the pond where the goldfish were, for they liked to watch them swim in the water. After exercise, they all went into the schoolroom, and Sing Ching told his teacher, I saw many goldfish swimming in the pond. Did you know that, teacher? A man fed them rice, and they all came out for him. They seemed so happy. They shook their tails and waved their fins, and swam up and down and all around in the cool water. Oh, I should like to be a fish. His teacher said, Learn lessons now. But Sing Ching could not study. He could only think. Think about the fish. Soon he asked that he might go out to drink. Then he went to the pond and took off his clothes. But the gardener saw him and asked, What are you doing, boy? This is school time. I want to be a fish, said Sing Ching. The gardener thought he wanted to catch the fish and said, The fish are for your eyes and not for your hands. Do not disturb them. Sing Ching sat down and waited until the gardener went away. Then he stepped into the water and talked to the fish. I am going to be one of you now, he said. Come to me and show me how to swim with you but they all hurried away. For half an hour he splashed in the shallow water trying to swim, until the teacher thought, Where is Sing Ching? and sent a boy to see. He found him in the pond and asked him to come into the schoolroom, saying the teacher would punish him if he did not. No, said Sing Ching, I shall be a fish. I told the teacher I was going to be a fish, and so the boy went back and told the teacher, who hardly knew what to think. Finally he went out with a stick and asked, Sing Ching, what are you doing here? Do you know this is school time? Do you know that you are allowed only to go out for a drink and not to stay here and play? You have done wrong. Why, teacher? I told you that I wanted to be a fish, said Sing Ching. I do not want books or exercises. I am going to be a fish, and I will not go to school. Mother said you teach everything. Now teach me to be a fish. His teacher said, How foolish you are, Sing Ching. You are a boy, a man. You can learn many things better than to be a fish. Come with me now. That night when Sing Ching was walking with his mother and nurse out by the water, he saw the summer moon shining in the lake. How strange, Amma! The moon is under the lake. See, it raises the lake and shakes it all the time. I want it. What kind of a white ball is it? Then his mother told him that the moon was in the sky, not in the lake. 
and she explained and showed him. And when he saw the moon in the sky, he said, I know that it is not the moon in the lake, for it shakes. It is not quite like the one in the sky. It is a silver ball, I know. He asked so many questions that his mother grew tired of answering, and let him ask unnoticed. Then he wandered away a little distance, and threw stones in the water, and the waters waved and the white ball danced so prettily that he wanted it very much. He waded into the lake deeper, deeper, until he fell down. He screamed and swallowed the water, and it took a long time to make him alive again, after his mother took him out of the lake. When the neighbours heard about it, they said, "'Foolish boy! Not satisfied to do the things he can, he is always wanting things he cannot have. Many people in this world are like Sing Ching. End of section 121「Section 122 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Nursery of My Book House, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Chinese Nursery Rhymes. Old Mr. Chang. Old Mr. Chang, I've oft heard it said, you wear a basket upon your head. You've two pair of scissors to cut your meat, and two pair of chopsticks with which you eat. Ladybug Ladybug, ladybug, fly away, do. Fly to the mountain and feed upon dew. Feed upon dew and sleep on a rug, and then run away like a good little bug. The Rice Cellar Someone is knocking loud at the door. The dog is making a great uproar. Now I inquire, who can it be? Tis only a donkey man, I see, calling out at the top of his voice, Here's the place to get your rice, coarse rice or fine, just to your mind, rice in the husk or cleaned by the wind. End of section 122 Section 123 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Hall. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. A Happy Day in the City by Olive Beaupre Miller. Ned and his mother stood on the corner by the florist shop waiting for the trolley car. Soon it came jangling up the track. Ned waved his hand to the motorman, and the big wheels squealed like a dozen little pigs as the car slowed down and stopped. Ned had the money for their fare held tight in his hand. He always gave it to the conductor himself. He and mother stepped aboard, and as the car started up with a jerk, they stumbled inside and made their way unsteadily to the only seat that was not already filled. Oh, but Ned was happy. He loved to go downtown on the trolley car. He loved the bumping and the jiggling and all the wonderful sights. Today he was especially happy, because he was going to meet his cousin Ruth and her mother, who lived in the country, and they were to have a long, beautiful day together in the city. He did not know what they were going to do to have a jolly time. Mother had kept that a secret. But he had seen Father slip out of the front door very quickly and mysteriously that morning, as if he were carrying something, and he guessed, but then never mind what he guessed, it was all a secret. As Ned looked out of the window, he saw a long row of stores with the gaily decorated front of the moving picture theater among them, and then they whisked past a row of tall apartment buildings, three and four stories high, where people made their homes all on a floor one family above another. It was on the top floor of just such a building that Ned and his father and mother lived. Apartment houses, and then stores, and then more apartment houses, and more stores. That was what he saw all the way downtown. When I grow up, cried Ned, as their motorman clanged his bell loudly, I'm going to be a motorman. Oh, said his mother, I thought you said yesterday, you wanted to be a hurdy-gurdy man, 
and have a street piano and a monkey. No, nope, announced Ned positively. I'm going to be a motorman, and then you'll see how I'll bang my foot down on the bell and make a big noise, clang, 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 and all the people will run to get out of the way of my car. So they went on for almost an hour, sometimes whizzing, sometimes jogging, sometimes crawling in a crowd behind some slow-moving delivery wagon that could not get off the tracks. At last they crossed the river and reached the marketplace of the city, where all the fruit and vegetables came in. There the delivery wagons, with their backs to the sidewalk, were crowded so close together that the horses stood straight out into the street, their noses up to the very trolley tracks. "'Oh, mother, we almost nipped that horse's nose,' squealed Ned, as they passed. Shortly after that, mother pressed a button beside their seat to let the conductor know they wanted to get off. The car stopped, and they stepped down on a crowded crossing, among automobiles and wagons, right under the tall iron framework where an elevated train was rushing by with a roaring, rumbling noise overhead. All the buildings they passed, as they walked along downtown, seemed turned a soft pearly gray by the city smoke. Everything was gray except the bright-colored signboards that stood out strikingly, and the gay red, yellow, and purple in a fruit stall here and there. Mother would not let Ned linger today to look at anything, for they must surely be on time to meet Ruth. Inside the great station they crossed the clean, marble-paved floor and went up the broad stairs to the place where the trains came in. A great iron fence shut off the tracks from the rest of the station, but a guard in blue uniform was already opening the gate to the platform where Ruth's train was pulling in, and a number of people were crowding about to meet friends whom they were expecting. "'Oh, I see her! I see her!' piped Ned. "'And there's Aunt Frances, too!' Sure enough, there they were, coming along in the midst of the crowd. Soon everybody was kissing everybody else, and Ruth was telling Ned about her new kittens and the garden she had made, and how she could read in her primer, all at once. Mother and Aunt Frances started on ahead, talking, with the children following behind them. "'Where are we going today?' asked Ruth. "'Oh, that's going to be a surprise. You mustn't ask,' said Ned. "'But I want to know,' insisted Ruth who never could wait for surprises. "'Well, this morning I saw Father slip out the front door, and I'm almost sure he was carrying—' But there Ned stopped, smiled mysteriously, and would not say another word. Mother and Aunt Frances went down a long flight of stairs and out of doors to a place where they all climbed up into a queer old-fashioned bus that was drawn by horses and ran from the station to the great stores. When the bus was filled with people, the driver climbed up into his seat in front, cried, Get up! to the horses, and they started off. But they had gone jiggling and joggling only a short distance over the cobblestone pavement when they heard the great noise of an alarm bell ringing, and the bus stopped. Ruth and Ned turned around and looked excitedly out of the window. They had just come to the bridge over the river, and, as the bell kept on ringing, People were hurrying and scurrying to get across. No sooner was the bridge empty than a chain was stretched over the approach to it, and a big policeman took his place there to prevent anyone else from stepping on it. Then the huge structure parted in the middle, and the two sides were raised straight up in the air by machinery from a little house on shore. Next, a great steamer with tall funnels, too tall to have passed under the bridge when it was down, was pulled by a little puffing, smoking tug slowly past the crossing, and the little tug whistled shrilly for the next bridge up the river to open out of its way. "'Oh, Ned!' cried Ruth, as she watched all this with breathless interest. "'I wonder how it would be if anybody would just hang on to the bridge and swing right up with it into the air.' "'Well,' laughed Mother, "'unless anybody was a fly.' I think anybody would not hang on very long. Splash! He'd go into the water, said Ned, and we'd have to fish him out. When the bridge was down again, the bus went jiggling and joggling on, till it came to a great store where everybody got out. 
The store took up a whole block and was at least fifteen stories high. All about were buildings so tall that, as they lifted their uneven outlines against the sky, the street seemed but a narrow slit between them. The bigness of it all made Ruth feel small and lonely, so she came nearer to Ned and took fast hold of his hand. But that wasn't the way the big buildings made Ned feel at all. "'When I get big,' he cried, "'I'm going to be a builder and build way, way, way up till I can touch the sky.' As he looked up to think how very high he was going to build, he stubbed his toe and fell flat on the sidewalk, pulling Ruth halfway down with him. <laughs> My dear little boy, laughed his mother, as she helped him up and brushed him off. Before you can build to the sky, you will have to learn to look where you take your next step. Inside the building there were many people, but the store was so large it did not seem crowded. There were any number of counters about, covered with lace and ribbons and gloves and handkerchiefs and many other things, and in one place there was an opening in the ceiling four or five stories high. Way, way up, so far it almost took your breath away to look, the roof of the great opening was a dome all made of tiny bits of colored glass that shone like jewels. Just like the castles in fairyland, said Ruth. They passed under a great archway draped with American flags, and then Mother and Aunt Frances stopped at the button counter. Ned was stooping down looking in the lower part of the glass showcase and thinking what fine wheels for his train some of the big buttons would make, when all of a sudden Ruth disappeared. They all three turned around toward the aisle at the same time, but she was nowhere to be seen. Aunt Frances called her, but she did not answer. Not one of the saleswomen or the floor walker had noticed where she went. So Mother Ned and Aunt Frances hunted and hunted, and at last they found her a long way off, looking longingly at a pile of little girls' parasols, and half covered up by a pink one that she had opened over her head. "'Why, Ruth Maxwell Martin,' said her mother, "'we've been hunting fifteen minutes for you. "'You are a big enough little girl "'to know you must not wander away.' "'Ruth hung her head and looked foolish.' "'for she was indeed big enough to know. "'But after Aunt Frances had made her understand "'how much trouble she had given them all, "'Mother bought her the little pink parasol to have for her own. "'Then Aunt Frances said, "'Most of our shopping isn't very interesting to the children. "'Let us leave them for an hour in the playroom.' "'So they all crossed over to a row of elevators, "'got into one with a great crowd of other people, "'and went up to the fourth floor.' Then they passed to the beautiful toy section and saw all the dolls and the dolls' houses and dolls' furniture and dolls' clothes and toy animals and toy villages and toy automobiles and toy aeroplanes and toy trains that would really run by electricity and toy stoves that would really cook by electricity and oh such a number of other things that Ruth sighed with delight. I wish I could live in a place like this. "'Well, you can live here for an hour,' laughed her mother, as they went on into the playroom. A great number of children were there, laughing and chattering, playing in sandboxes, sliding down wooden slides, rocking back and forth on great horses as big as life, riding on little merry-go-rounds, or swinging in the swings. Ned and Ruth had time to try everything that was fun in the whole place before their mothers came back again. When they all started out once more, the hands of the big clock above the elevators pointed to twelve o'clock, so they went into the nice, clean marble washroom and got ready for lunch. Then they went up to the restaurant. The room where they found themselves was one of five or six lunchrooms that covered the whole seventh floor of the building. It was very gaily painted and had a number of little tables about. In the center of the room was a beautiful fountain with a statue in the middle and goldfish swimming in it. Ned and Ruth could hardly bear to leave the little darting goldfish, even to order lunch. But when Aunt Frances called them, they went and sat down at a table with a white cloth on it, and a candlestick with a pretty pink shade in the center. Then a neat young woman in black, with a white apron, came and brought them each a card that had a list of all the good things they might have to eat. Mother and Aunt Frances told the waitress what to bring, so she went off and came back soon with her big tray loaded. There was some orange and banana salad in a pretty nest of lettuce for each of them. 
There were some buns covered with sugar and currants, and four little bottles of milk. For dessert, they each had chocolate ice cream. It was then that Ruth said, Oh, I'm having such a happy time, but I do wish I knew where we are going this afternoon. Well, said Mother, suppose we all go home and take a nap. Oh, no, 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 shrieked both children. But that was all Mother would say. After lunch, they left the big store and came out on the crowded street. Such a number of people as there were, all busily hurrying somewhere. There wasn't any lingering here. Everybody had something to do and was keeping right about his business of getting there to do it. In the street there seemed a tangled mass of automobiles and wagons and trolley cars. But there were two policemen on the corner, and when Ruth and Ned reached there, they could see that what had seemed such a tangled mass was very orderly after all. When the policeman whistled once and held up his hand, all the automobiles and wagons and trolley cars went in one direction, while the others waited, and when he blew his whistle twice, they all went in the other direction, so they never interfered with each other. "'When I grow up, I'm surely going to be a big policeman,' said Ned. "'Then you'll hold up your hand and make all the wagons wait while I cross the street, won't you?' said Ruth. Soon they came to the wide boulevard, where were all the finest small shops in the city. On the farther side of the street was a pretty strip of green park with shrubbery, flowers, and statues that stretched all the way up the avenue, and beyond that strip sparkled the blue waters of the lake. But Ned, Ruth, Mother, and Aunt Frances were chiefly interested in the windows of the shops on their own side of the street as they walked along. Ned stopped in front of the electrical shop, where were washing machines and fans and all sorts of things running by electricity. Ruth lingered by the big waxen figures of beautiful ladies like great wax dolls, dressed in such beautiful clothes they made the little girl think of the princesses in her fairy tales. Mother and Aunt Frances looked in at the linen and jewelry, and they all stopped together to peep at the candy and the flowers. "'I know where we're going,' whispered Ned to Ruth, "'to Father's office.' Sure enough, they went into a large office building, rode up in the elevator, and walked down a long hall into Father's office. There was Father working busily at his desk. "'Well, hello!' he cried, as he whirled around in his chair, kissed Ruth, put his arm around Ned, shook hands with Aunt Frances, and smiled at Mother. "'Oh, Uncle!' cried Ruth. "'Please tell me, where are we going this afternoon?' But Father wouldn't tell either. He just smiled, got up, and left the room. While they were waiting for him to come back, the children went over to the window and looked out. They were up very high, and the people and automobiles in the street below looked very small. Nearby, on the other side of the street, was a great stone building with two fine bronze lions on either side of the broad steps guarding the entrance. In the carved border, about the top, where Ruth and Ned could see them clearly, a number of pigeons roosted, while others flew circling about in the air or dropped down into the park below to bathe and play in the waters of the fountain. Farther on, beyond the green stretch of parkway, they could just see the tops of trains on a track down below the level of the ground. From the engines rose little cottony white and gray curls of smoke that floated away and melted into the soft haze hanging over the lake beyond. Sometimes the sunlight pierced the haze and flashed back brightly from the water, from the white sail of a boat or the wing of a great white bird. It was all very soft and bright and lovely. In a few moments back came Father, and there, as he stood in the doorway, the children saw he had the big picnic basket over his arm. "'Oh, we're going to have a picnic. That's what we're going to do. I thought so,' piped Ned. "'Where are we going?' "'How would Lincoln Park do?' asked Father. "'I've brought the basket down this morning, and it's been in Mr. Smith's icebox ever since.' "'Oh, goody, goody!' cried the children. They waited on the corner for the motor bus. The bus ran just like an automobile, and beside the inside seats it had seats up on its roof. Ned and Father let the ladies go up first, so the bus had started before they and the picnic basket got to the top, and it was the queerest, wobbliest feeling to stagger up, clutching hold of the rail and tumble into a seat. Up there one could see everything— the bus made a loop around the main streets downtown, then it started out toward the park. 
Soon it was running along the smooth black pavement of a wide boulevard, past beautiful homes and under fine old trees. Oh, but it was jolly to be right up in the treetops. At last they came into the fresh green park and passed a little harbor, where a number of pretty launches were anchored. They went over a stone bridge, past beds of beautiful flowers, by a marble bandstand, and beneath a great towering statue of General Grant on horseback. Then they all got off at a pretty knoll with a fine view over the lake. There, in the shade of a tree, Mother and Aunt Frances sat on a bench to rest. Father, after he put down the lunch basket, started with the two children to see the animals and birds. In the birdhouse there was such a screeching they could hardly hear themselves think, and in the cages round about there was every kind of gay or sober-colored bird from all the corners of the world. In the center of the room was a pond filled with water birds. Some of these were very long-legged, some were very short-legged, and some were very queer indeed, especially one important old white pelican, who strutted about and seemed to think he owned the pond. "'When you grow up, Ned, how would you like to be a pelican?' asked Father with a twinkle in his eye. But just at that moment Ruth covered her ears with her hands and said, "'Oh, it's too noisy in here. Let's go on.' So they walked on past the zebras, the llamas, the deer, the camels, and the buffaloes. Then they came back over some steps and by the pits of the bears, the foxes, and wolves. They saw the giraffes eating hay out of a high trough, and the elephant swinging his trunk and flapping his ears beneath a canvas canopy. They spent a long time laughing at the ridiculous antics of the monkeys, and last of all, they visited the great house where the lions, tigers, and leopards are kept. "'I'd like to see a real wild tiger prowling around in the jungle,' said Ned as they were returning. "'That's what I should.' "'Oh, dear, I shouldn't,' said Ruth. "'What would you do, Ned, if you did see one?' "'I think,' answered Father very solemnly, "'that Ned would run after the lion like a brave man and sprinkle salt on his tail.' By the time they got back to Mother and Aunt Frances, they were ready to sit down on the soft grass beneath the tree and rest. But even here there was plenty of interest to watch. Nearby, a party of children were having a picnic, laughing and playing pretty games, while strings of Japanese lanterns had been strung up around them through the trees. On the sandy beach of the lake, a number of other children were wading or bathing, and every now and then, farther out beyond them, a boat of some kind passed. It was all so pleasant the time seemed to fly on wings. Before they knew it, supper was all spread out on the grass. It was growing dusk, and the little Japanese lanterns were lit and twinkling among the trees when Aunt Frances said, "'Now, girlie, we must start for home, or you'll never be able to keep your eyes open till we get on the train.' So Ned and Ruth kissed each other goodbye. Father hailed the southbound bus and helped Ruth and Aunt Frances aboard. Then, as they rode away, Ned and Ruth waved their hands to each other and cried, "'Good-bye, good-bye. We'll have another happy day like this next year.'" End of Section 123 Recording by Jeannie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland Section 124 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupra Miller. City Smoke by Olive Bupra Miller. From tall black chimneys leaps the smoke, climbs high the drifting ladder of the wind leaves far behind the chasing flames that mount the sky to catch it, laughs out its joy in soft white puffs, then slowly fades to pearl and purple, and settling to the earth, outspreads o'er the city in brooding dove-gray wings. End of section 124 Recording by Verity Kendall Section 125 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupra Miller. Night and Day by Mary Mapes Dodge. When I run about all day, when I kneel at night and pray, God sees. When I'm dreaming in the dark, when I lie awake and hark, God sees. Need I ever know a fear, night and day my father's near, God sees. End of section 125. Recording by Verity Kendall. Section 126 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet Morris. In the Nursery of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Babe Moses. There was a king over Egypt who knew nothing of God. Therefore he thought no good in his heart. And he said, There live in the midst of our land the children of Israel. They are not of our people, yet they are more in numbers than we. I fear lest they have too many babes that grow up to be strong men and stand against us. Come on, then, let us throw into the river every boy babe that is born unto them. Now there was at this time in Egypt a certain man and his wife of the children of Israel, and there was born unto them a boy babe, even such a one as Pharaoh the king had commanded should be thrown into the river. But he was a goodly child, and his mother loved him, and held him close to her heart, and cherished him, and she kept him hid three months, that Pharaoh's servants might not find him and throw him into the river. And when she could no longer hide him, she gathered bulrushes from the river bank, and made of them a little ark. And she daubed the ark with mud and pitch, and put her babe therein, and laid him in the rushes by the river. Then she bade his sister stand afar off, and watch what would be done to him. And she kissed the little one, and went back to her home, for her trust was in God, and she knew that God was with the child to save him. And it came to pass that the daughter of Pharaoh the king came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river side. When she saw the ark among the rushes, she sent her maid to get it, and when she had laid back the coverings, she saw the little babe, and behold, he was crying. Then Pharaoh's daughter was filled with pity for the child, and she took him to her and said, This is a babe of the children of Israel. Even such a one as my father has commanded should be thrown into the river. But as she held the little one in her arms and saw how he wept, God touched her heart, and she thought within herself to save the child. For she knew that the king, her father, would grant unto her whatsoever she asked of him. So she cried out to her maids and said, I will ask of the king, my father, that I may keep this little one. He shall be as my own son. Then came the sister of the babe, who had been watching, and said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the women of Israel, that she may care for the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's own mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto the child's mother, Take this child away, and nurse him for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the mother took her little babe, and held him close, and rejoiced, and gave thanks in her heart that God had saved him. And she nursed the child, and he grew, and when he was no more a babe, she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter in the house of the king, and Pharaoh's daughter kept him as her own son, and she called his name Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. End of section 126. Recording by Janet Morris. Section 127 of In the Nursery of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rahimus Holmes. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Psalm 100. A Psalm of Praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. End of section 127. Recording by Rahimus Holmes. Section 128 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Verity Kendall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Bupra Miller. Little Blue Apron. Little Blue Apron, how do you do? Never a stocking and never a shoe. Little Blue Apron, she answered me. You don't wear stockings and shoes by the sea. Little Blue Apron, never a hat. How do you manage to go out like that? Why, what is the use of a hat? said she. You never wear hats when you're by the sea. Why, Little Blue Apron, it seems to me very delightful to live by the sea. But what would hatters and shoemakers do if everyone lived by the sea like you? End of section 128. Recording by Verity Kendall. Section 129 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Hall. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Doll Under the Briar Rose Bush. By Jurgen Moe. Translated from the Norwegian by Gudrun Thorne Thompson. There was once a little girl, and her name was Beata. She was only five years old but a bright and good little girl she was. On her birthday, her father had given her a beautiful straw hat. There were red ribbons around it. I can't tell you how pretty it was. Her mother had given her a pair of yellow shoes and the daintiest white dress. But her old aunt had given her the very best present of all. It was a doll with a sweet, pretty face and dark brown curls. She was a perfect beauty in every respect. There was nothing the matter with her except that the left eyebrow was painted a tiny bit too high up. It looks as if she were frowning a little. I wonder if she is not quite pleased, asked Beata, when she held her in her arms. Oh, yes, answered her aunt, but she doesn't know you yet. It is a habit she has of always lifting her eyebrow a little, when she looks closely at anyone. She only wants to find out if you are a good little girl. Yes, yes, and now she knows, for now that eyebrow is just like the other one, said Beata. Oh, how Beata grew to love that doll, almost more than she loved Marie and Louise, and they were her best friends. One day, Beata was walking in the yard with her doll in her arms. The doll had a new name now, and they had become fast friends. She had called her Piata, her own name, and the name of her old aunt, who had given her the doll. It was early in the spring. There was a beautiful green spot, with fine, soft grass in one corner of the yard around the old well. There stood a big willow tree with a low trunk, and it was covered with the little yellow blossoms that children call goslings. They looked like goslings, too, for each little tassel was soft, soft yellow down, and they can swim in the water, but walk? 
No, that they cannot do. Now Big Beata, she wasn't more than five years old, but she was ever so much bigger than the other one. And little Beata soon agreed that they would pick goslings from the tree and throw them into the well so that they might have just as good a time as the goslings that were swimming about in the pond. It was really Big Beata who thought of this first, but little Beata agreed immediately. You can't imagine how good she always was. Now Big Beata climbed up into the willow and picked many pretty yellow goslings into her white apron. And when she counted them and had counted to twenty twice, she said that now they had enough, and little Beata thought so too. So she began to climb down, but that was not easy, for she had to hold her apron together with one hand and climb with the other. She thought little Beata called up to her to throw the goslings down first, but she didn't dare to do that. She was afraid they might fall and hurt themselves. Now both of them ran over to the well, and Big Beata helped her little friend to get her legs firmly fixed between the logs that were around the well, so that they might sit in comfort and watch the little gosling swim about on the water. Then gosling after gosling was dropped down, and as soon as each one reached the water, it seemed to become alive, and it moved about. Oh, what fun! Big Beata clapped her hands to the pretty little downy birds, and when she helped little Beata a bit, she too could clap her hands. But after a while, the little goslings would not swim any longer, but lay quite still. That was no fun at all. So Big Beata asked her namesake if she didn't think she might lean a little over the edge of the well and blow on them, for then she thought they might come to life again. Little Beata didn't answer, but she raised her left eyebrow a good deal, and moved her right arm in the air as if she were saying, "'Please don't do that, dear Big Beata. "'Don't you remember Mother has told us how dark it is down there in the well? "'Think if you should fall in!' "'Oh, nonsense! Just see how easy it is,' said Big Beata, "'for she thought the goslings were stupid when they didn't want to swim about. "'She leaned out over the well and blew on the nearest ones. "'Yes, it helped. The goslings began to swim again.' "'but those that were farthest away didn't move at all. "'What stupid little things!' said Beata, "'and she leaned far, far out over the edge of the well. "'Then her little hand slipped on the smooth log, "'and splash! "'In she fell, deep down in the water. "'It was so cold, so icy cold, "'and it closed over her head "'and took the straw hat, "'which she had got on her birthday, off her hair. "'She hadn't time to hear if little Beata screamed. "'but I'm sure she did. "'When Beata's head came over the water again, "'she grasped the round log with both her hands. "'But the hands were too small, "'and the log so wide and slippery, "'she couldn't hold on. "'Then she saw her dear friend, "'little Beata, standing stiff and staring at her "'with her right arm stretched out to her. "'Big Beata hurriedly caught hold of her, "'and little Beata made herself as stiff as she could, "'and stiffer still, and stood there between the logs holding her dear friend out of the water. Now Beata screamed so loudly that her father and mother heard her and came running as fast as they could and pulled her out. She was dripping wet and so cold that her teeth chattered. The father ran to the house with her, but she begged him for heaven's sake not to leave little Beata, for she might fall into the well, and it's she who has saved me. Now they put Beata to bed, and little Beata had to sleep with her. When she had said her prayers, she hugged her little friend and said, Never, never can I thank you enough, because you saved me from that deep well, dear little Beata. Of course, I know that our Lord helped you to stand firm between the logs, and to make yourself so strong and stiff, but it was you, and no one else, who stretched your hand out to me. End of section 129. Recording by Jeannie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland. Section 130 of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Federica. In the Nursery of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. 
The Elf and the Dormouse by Oliver Herford Under a toadstool crept a wee elf out of the rain to shelter himself. Under the toadstool sound asleep sat a big dormouse all in a heap. Trembled the wee elf, frightened, and yet fearing to fly away lest he get wet. To the next shelter, maybe a mile. Sudden the wee elf smiled a wee smile tugged till the toadstool toppled in two. Holding it over him, gaily he flew. Soon he was safe home, dry as could be. Soon woke the dormouse. Good gracious me, where is my toadstool? Loud he lamented. And that's how umbrellas first were invented. End of section 130 Recording by Federica End of In the Nursery of My Bookhouse by Olive Bopper Miller